there that works. Uh, welcome to the workshop with Sarah Marshall. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you would like, also consider joining us for the reading at the library tonight, the, the Longview Public Library, which is across the street in the direction of my finger, um, tonight at 5.30. Um, this is our last Northwest Voices event for uh, the fall quarter. Uh, we'll be back in the winter and the spring with events that I haven't fully booked yet, but um, that I'm communicating with people about. So I'm pretty excited, but can't say when and what yet. Um, but today is Sarah Marshall and, and uh, Sarah Marshall is a podcaster and a writer and a media critic and all around uh, amazing human being uh, who lives in Portland, Oregon, and is working on a book about uh, bimbos, um, among other things. And so that I think is what this this part is going to be about. So um, everyone, Sarah Marshall. That'll work now. Nice. All right. Um, it's so nice to see you here learning about one of the most pressing issues of our time. I love having picture in picture of the very room we're in. There we go. Perfect. Um, so this is kind of the book topic stuff I'm mulling over in slideshow form. It's called How to Succeed in Bimbo Studies While Trying Very Hard, and it's autobiographical. Um, <laughs> This is an op-ed from 1987, and I like that Kim Murphy over here needed to think of a title, and she was like, ah, bimbos. I'm done. Um, 1987 was dubbed the year of the bimbo because it was the year of Jessica Hahn, Donna Rice, and Fawn Hall, uh, who are interesting uh, for many different reasons, but all found themselves geographically close to a very power to a very powerful man who was completely imploding and then somehow being blamed for it um i'm seeing nodding in the second row is there anything to add <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's 1987 was the year of the hot mess but we hadn't come up with that term linguistically yet so we had to struggle through somehow um and so these are all women that i have talked about on you're wrong about in one way or another fawn hall was tangentially involved in the iran contra scandal she was given documents by her boss ollie north to lose somehow um and he objectively had the power in that scenario um, to kind of engineer a massive scandal for the Reagan administration, which Reagan successfully walked right through with the fairly plausible argument that he believed in his heart he was doing the right thing and didn't really understand what was going on. Uh, so Fawn Hall got to kind of interestingly become the face of a Washington scandal that she had almost nothing to do with. Donna Rice uh, was photographed sitting in the lap of Gary Hart, who was the front runner for the presidential election in 1988. He was a Democrat who would have theoretically stood between America and George H.W. Bush. Um, and the question of whether she was a plant by the opposition is somewhat, seems like that could have happened or maybe not. But that the point is that Donna Rice got credit for derailing a presidential campaign that was very young and that could have really gone in any number of directions. Um, and also that uh, a candidate who was kind of known for having a weakness when it came to women gets to, again, be sort of distanced from his own potentially bad decision making on the campaign trail. Um, and then Jessica Hahn, who was connected to the downfall of uh, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, who were the televangelists of the 80s. And the interesting thing about her whole story to me is that Jim Baker went down for fraud because he had been running his televangelist empire um, fairly illegally, which is pretty common, I think. And that Jessica Hahn accused him of sexual assault, and she was seen as the one who had somehow brought down his his whole castle, even though 
her claims really didn't stick to him. And the problem was that he had been defrauding uh, all of his very devout followers. And then what kind of, what I love about, or what I don't love, but what's really revealed in this piece is the idea that, you know, she then posed for Playboy. One of the things she talked about was that she had posed for Playboy because they were, uh, regardless of what they are or aren't, the only magazine that wanted to really publish an extended version of her account of her claims about Jim Baker sexually assaulting her. And also, a court by her own account at the time, liked doing some nice nudes and lewds for them. And I think there's something kind of at the heart of that idea there that's the kernel that I'm kind of trying to pop um, and understand of what kind of behavior do we need in order to trust that someone um, is telling the truth and is has not set up a scenario where they cleverly got sexually assaulted by a very powerful man and then got to be in Playboy. Um, and these are questions that the media and the conversations we can have with the technology um, available to us, we have all gotten much better, I think, at questioning the assumption that somebody's trauma is rendered moot by the fact that they posed nude at some point later on in their life. Um, but it's still an impulse that we see very clearly in the culture that we're in and are trying to find a place for ourselves inside of. Um, I liked this. This is a stock image of a bimbo. You can buy this with an extended license for $17.99. I like that this is an, our, our iconic bimbo. She's wearing a wig of her own hair. She just can't get it together. Can't do anything right. Um, this is a graphic of what to me is kind of bimbo uh, event horizon. We all know what this is. This is Barbenheimer. And to me, this was a funny moment because I think the kind of tone as these two movies were approaching having an opening day on the same weekend was, ha, 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 ha. isn't it so funny to think of this piece of girly frivolity happening at the same time as a very important movie we'll all remember forever. And this is a contentious claim, but I think Barbie is the movie that we will remember forever. And, you know, it was a movie that I, you know, to me, part of the joy of watching Barbie is watching Greta Gerwig really thread a needle as she tries to make a feminist movie while holding hands with Mattel. Um, so, you know, it's not perfect, but I think what one of the things I love about media and about studying media is that we get to look not just at what's happening in the story and the intentions of the storytellers as conscious or unconscious as they may be, um, but also get to use it as a way to take the temperature of the society that we're in and the world that we're in and kind of seeing the outpouring of joy that awaited Barbie um, was just... I, really kind of wonderful and fascinating to me and kind of seeing the joy that people can allow themselves to take about something that is in this place in the culture. Um, to me suggests that we are approaching the era of the bimbo and I am ready. Um, and then this is a piece of merch that exemplifies both how far the term bimbo can travel, I think outside of any kind of binary gender identity and also how non-binary people get charged too much for stuff because this sweatshirt is $65 and I think that's unnecessary. Um, there's a picture of me and my bimbo academia era. This is me after I have stayed up all night working on something and I'm about to go teach on no sleep. And I think that's pretty obvious from the way I look. And I like this picture of me because it's from my try hard period as a scholar, as I was writing about, you know, American history, kind of colonial American uh, accounts of 17th century women, um, and trying to figure out if there is a place where I could make a living talking about uh, unserious topics like Tanya Harding and Tammy Faye Baker. And I did somehow. And there's Tanya. I talked about this a little bit earlier, so I'll keep it shorter so people don't have to hear my, me repeat myself. But this gets into the question of what is bimbo, who is bimbo? Um, and I was I was actually having a phone call uh, earlier with my mom and one of my oldest friends. So I was really regressing to like my 15 or 16 year old self in a great way. 
and I was expl- they were like oh what are you going to talk about what's your what are you doing right now and I was like I'm going to talk about bimbo theory and my mom and my former best friend both mentioned Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene as examples of bimbos and I was aghast um because to me the kind of the iconic bimbo my iconic bimbo voice is just a Harley Quinn impression you all have to deal with that but it's you know to me the a bimbo is someone who ends up holding the bag in a situation that she had nothing to do with and that is really about the follies of men and how can we transfer the blame to her so a bimbo is the kind of person you'd hear saying i didn't know they just said i could have 50 dollars to go make out in a car with this goy and then he got shot and now i'm on this cross-country caper um that's my unfilmable madonna script (laughs) and we have to go back in time to the 80s to do it but it'll be worth it um and so to me the concept of a bimbo and this is something that you see in kind of the year of the bimbo when this word is kind of unavoidable in america in 87 jessica hahn said i am not a bimbo similar to nixon's i am not a crook if you have to say it it's because people are thinking it and the thing that's happened in the past couple years kind of in pop culture and in social media is kind of i've been inspired by seeing people reclaiming bimbo himbo and thembo because to me there's some kind of connection there with also, you know, and I think that this was a big, one of the gifts of the pandemic, with so many people realizing that they're neurodivergent and that the problem is not that they are bad people who are too lazy to do the work, but that the work is too hard or the work makes no sense or the work is engineered for someone else's brain, but not yours. Um, And so the bimbo is kind of, you know, the figure in these stories I've been talking about who has the temerity to be Um, hot in public, which we both want and really don't want women to do. I really, I don't quite understand what that's all about. Um, But also who has not escaped the category of woman by sort of, by proving that she's smart and she's resourceful and she doesn't make dumb mistakes and she doesn't complain about breaking a nail. I think we should be able to complain about breaking nails. It's serious. Um, can lead to infection and that there's something really exciting I think in the kind of conversations that we're having uh, culturally today and that I want to contribute to that you shouldn't have to say I am not a bimbo therefore please stop torturing me Um, please stop mocking me in the public eye and feeling good about it please uh, take me seriously see me as someone who's deserving of empathy see me as someone with a thought in my head because the fact is that we all have thoughts in our heads, but you just don't necessarily shouldn't be expected to prove it quite so often. So Tanya Harding is the bimbo that I started with. Is she a big QAnon person now? Yeah. Can I save her? No. So I'm just living with that. Um, and I've been emailing with the guy who writes the Tanya Harding fan club newsletter. He's this very nice guy named Terry, and he lives in New Zealand, and he's concerned because she hasn't got vaccinated and she has asthma. We don't know what to do. So me and me and Terry, we're working on it. Um, this is an iconic New York Magazine article. Chris mentioned this earlier. This is called White Trash Nation. It is one of the worst things I've ever read. And it's this alarmist, I I honestly think Tad Friend is a very good writer and was supposed, it was given this article to write and then kind of forgot about it. And then on Sunday night, he just thought about everything he'd seen on TV lately and wrote it really fast. That's what I choose to believe. But it's a fascinating article making the argument that galloping sleaze is taking over America and taking over our culture. And I'm going to show you a couple little quotes from it. And this is, of course, Anna Nicole Smith on the cover. And she didn't like this photo because it was taken during a modeling assignment when she thought that these were pictures that they wouldn't use. And surprise, they did. They always do. Okay, so this is the opening. This is the opening of this article. This is about Paula Jones, who, while uh, former President Bill Clinton was running for office, accused him very credibly of sexual harassment, and we did not worry about it, because why would we worry about it? This is a interview with her relatives. 
If I hadn't been married, I'd probably have propositioned her myself, Mark Brown says of his sister-in-law, Paula Corbin Jones, who is suing President Clinton for sexual harassment. Paula dressed shit, provocative ain't even the word for it. You could see the crease of her ass and at least two lips, maybe three. I don't know. If a woman dresses to where a man is almost seeing it, dot, 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 this is a, this dot, dot, dot is doing a lot of work. Um, and so that this is, I could spend, I could stand here for 10 hours and talk about why this paragraph bothers me so much, because it's basically, it's an article about credible allegations against somebody who was running for president, the question of what kind of power dynamics are in play if you're a man in politics, if you talk to uh, people at campaign events and, you know, maybe even imagine yourself taking part in something consensual, but you do not understand the the sort of power that is in your corner at the time. And there's there's so much interesting worth talking about here. Paula Jones's husband was in Jim Jarmusch's mystery train for God's sake. He was not, he was a not very good Elvis impersonator and they needed one on set that day and he was around. Um, but it's so disturbing to me that this first paragraph, which does not try to explain itself is about, well, this is how she dressed. So she doesn't have to consent to anything sexual. That's for sure. And that there's no attempt to position this is the argument. We're all simply supposed to know that this is the argument. And speaking of neurodivergency, I think there's something very powerful in not just choosing to stay outside of the flock or the school of fish, but simply not even really knowing how to be in it and sort of looking at some kind of cultural norm or accepted concept and saying, but why? I don't understand what you're saying. What are you implying to me? Um, and I've heard that actually this is a great tactic if someone is making uh, jokes in your vicinity that are offensive to every fiber of your moral being. Instead of laughing anxiously along like I always do, you apparently can go, oh, I don't understand. Explain to me why that is funny. And so I encourage people to try that, especially at Thanksgiving. Um, <laughs> And here's the paragraph on Tanya, which is just kind of, to me, is kind of the keystone of everything that I was trying to write against when I wrote this piece on Tanya Harding that came out in 2014, um, many eons ago. But this idea that you just need to kind of summon a collection of nouns in order to vilify her, and that's going to be enough. Like, this sentence is really something. She of the bleached permed hair, the blank cheap eyes, the rabbit fur coat, and the job working at Spud City. Um, magazines love to mention this at the time, by the way, that like, well, she's an Olympian, but she works at Spud City, as if it's so funny that in Oregon, we had a mall potato restaurant for a while. You go shopping, you crash, you need a potato. It's fine. Um, but this idea that sort of, again, we can take her humanity less seriously because she works at Spud City and her life is is funny and therefore it can't be a tragedy even if it is to her. Um, I don't know this paragraph is very motivating for me because it was something that you know this if something is published in a magazine with this kind of distribution like it goes through rounds of editing it goes through fact checking it goes through a lot of pairs of eyeballs on it and so for something to get this far and be so kind of remarkably cruel, um, it says a lot. And I guess I encourage everybody in their own work to find the thing that really pisses you off and use that to motivate you because uh, spite and resentment will linger in the tank long after all of your other fuel is gone, or at least it does for me. I'm a very angry person secretly. Um, and this is my final slide. This is an alternate title for a horror movie that we know, those of us who know it as I Spit on Your Grave. There's a great trailer for this you can watch on YouTube where the narrator says, I spit on your grave. I spit on your grave. Let's repeat this 20 times. And the top comment is, what is the title of the movie? Um, but this is my prediction 
for the future of the bimbo. We've had the year of the bimbo. I think we are moving toward the day of the bimbo when bimbos will rise up and take their revenge violently if necessary. Um, and that to me kind of bimbos are my way of understanding the fact that in America specifically, although in many corners of the world in their own way, but this is the corner I know, uh, we are all bimbos because to be called a bimbo is to be told that you are failing to perform your gender correctly um, and by the guidelines that you have been given by a society that is pretty much organized around the idea that it doesn't like you that much anyway. And so you'd better keep in line. And I think the really exciting thing about that is that technically none of us are performing our gender correctly if we go by you know, the most extremely uh, traditionalist and claiming to be immutable, but it turns out very arbitrary rules that we are raised by. Most of us are raised in a tradition that tells us that no matter what we do, we're doing it wrong. So let's do it wrong and let's do it wrong together. And let's have the day of the bimbo. And that is my talk. Thank you. Did you ever get direct feedback from on your hotel? Being from Fort Creek? I. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. we're, we're attempting to record. <laughs> you can sit there. No, I'll get in frame, yeah. Okay. Um, so everyone can see my sneakers. Um, so I did try and interview her in 2017 around when I, Tanya, was coming out. And I, like, missed the window just barely because she was, like, talking to people for interviews for a while. She was interviewed for the New York Times and then at a certain point, I think just got exhausted and her manager was like, Tanya is only doing interviews if she can be paid. And I was like, well, I can't offer that. And I appreciate her situation. Um, but I think like she made a reference in like an interview around that time to like all these people who have like made a career writing about me and saying things about me. And I was like, oh no, I made a career saying things about her. So I, I don't know. I feel like she doesn't and wouldn't like me, but I will love her for the rest of my life and there's nothing she can do about it. Ha ha. Oh my, really? What was that like? Yeah. Was she just like, I mean, was it? Yeah. Right. So yeah yeah it's also like when i was researching you know tiny harding and the whole story around her um I was like 22, 23, and she and Nancy Kerrigan were like 22, 23, 24 when all that was happening. And I was just like, this is nuts. I feel like we were talking in the media at the time as if these were grown ass women. And in fact, they're like, you know, very, very young and also have had basically no time to grow up because they've been training the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to be something you brought up frequently that that uh, um, a lot of these women had experienced some sort of trauma in, in their past, or they'd been abused, or they'd been assaulted, or, uh, you know, and and that doesn't seem to give them any sort of sympathy or, or empathy from, from the general public, or especially the news media writing uh, the kinds of things that you put on display there. Um, yeah, yeah, which is really, you know, again, like so much of what I'm talking about, I feel like is being talked about generally in, in kind of mainstream culture today in a really thrilling way. And one of them is the the idea that we demand kind of the performance of the perfect victim and what's hard to what's hard and really important to internalize, I think, is the idea that trauma actually doesn't make people better at like gain, getting the help they need. Yeah. Um, for 
Right. Or I guess this idea of like, well, why were you in this relationship if it was abusive? And the idea that, you know, that it is somehow um, the job of the individual to rescue themselves every time is really, you know, quite remarkable. Why were you in that building when it caught on fire? Well, right. And you brought that up about about Tanya that there is and it was in the you you, you didn't mention it in the slide previously about the um the wedding video the, oh, the yeah. wedding night video right yeah and that that um well why don't you talk about that you you would yeah, yeah so th this is wild she there's like six weeks during which the story of tanya and nancy is all over news all, all over the news it starts off and um start of january 1994 january 6 1994 by the way um so something astrologically wrong with that time i guess but when uh Tanya's ex-husband's friend's friend clubs uh, Nancy Kerrigan while she's going to a practice session in Detroit and then six or seven weeks into the skating at the Winter Olympics and that's kind of all anyone can talk about and so during that period uh, Tanya's ex-husband sells their it's partly a wedding night tape it's partly just a home sex tape but sells it uh to penthouse and the way tanya tells it and she has been an unreliable witness about aspects of her own life and that's you know um worth considering but her story was that they were like we're going to publish it either way because they had stills of it that they put in the magazine as well as releasing a video um but if you agree then you can get some money out of it so you might as well get paid or that they were going to release, you know, some aspect of it, but she had the chance to get on, get on track to get some kind of payment for this. Cause something that's so interesting about ending up in this kind of scandal. And then for example, getting paid to pose for playboy is what, and what I think people are like, hopefully much more able to understand now that like, it seems like so many of us like know somebody or know somebody who knows somebody who, was on reality TV one time or who like went viral on TikTok and like had like something happened for them that like there isn't actually money that you get just for everyone paying attention to you. Like it can open the door for you to do that if you get, you know, today brand deals and back then um, sponsorship and things like that. But that actually like having your life r ran over by the media, like they don't pay you anything. They just kind of make you notorious and then leave and then how you figure out how to uh you know and then if you're rendered unemployable by that then it becomes especially difficult to pick up the pieces so this you know this kind of media landscape in which you can see sort of tabloid media generating um the guarantee of future business for itself because every time you somebody you rolled over gets back up and tries to um start over you get to come find them again well yeah and um not to monopolize the question so i have a follow-up question on that but if anybody else has a question um i'd love to pass the mic over but um you know you'll get one eventually you'll think of one but um that was something that i noticed as a thread through a lot of the podcasts was the way in which um lives were destroyed uh by um the the media attention uh to the particular story right so one of the ones you you talked about was the famous uh, mcdonald's lawsuit with the coffee uh another one was uh what happened to um can't remember the name but you're gonna remember it from the from the uh episode on the porn wars and the the deep throat um the the one linda lovelace you know, aka linda borman yeah. also the the man um oh yeah harry, harry reams. reams yes yeah yeah um yeah i mean that's definitely a trend and i think the when i started doing the show with michael you know his interest was in kind of I think debunking, debunking pop, pop psychology and pop sociology stuff. And this idea of, you know, like in the nineties, everyone loved talking about how like statistically we eat 30 spiders a year. And like, where did that statistic come from? We didn't do an episode on that, but we should. Um, and I, and I had this backlog, this backlog of, of stories like that, that I feel like I had just gathered by growing up watching too much TV 
in the the 90s and into the early 2000s and then i feel like you know things started to turn around kind of i kind of feel like lindsay lohan was the last woman we did this with you know i guess kind of like destroyed her life on purpose and we're like that was fun and then it's not that you know we yeah yeah right and like and she and no matter what she does she's like always going to make a lot of people a lot of money she's always going to drive traffic there's it's always going to be profitable to cover her um but that something happened i feel like you know late 2000s into the 2010s where social media meant not that people said necessarily smarter things but there could be like countervailing voices and forces within the conversations that we were having publicly because you know, these stories in the 90s, like a lot of people were like in their homes or in their lives, like saying very sensible things. They just couldn't go on TV about it, which would have been incredible, though. Right. And we'd be like, and now we're getting a call from someone who has something normal to say. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I feel, and I guess maybe that's what you call a tipping point or something, but like that this really seems actually to be now that you say that like a very consistent thing in human behavior where like we will experience a problem we'll see it in our community or experience it personally and then often find a way you know to be like well it's my fault or well it just happened to me or it just happened um in my community or my social circle and or just you know i think one of the ways that abuse stays so invisible is that like if someone I know is in an abusive relationship, like I can see that and I can tell, but if I'm in an abusive situation, I will not realize it until months to years later. Um, because I think there's something about our natural inclination to not take our own needs and feelings seriously that then can get very reinforced by, by a culture that benefits from us behaving that way. And so, I mean, it reminds me of actually, you know, in 2001, how, the huge famously the spotlight report on sexual abuse within the catholic church came out and it wasn't that there weren't stories like that before especially at the local level it just that was the first time that people were able to put it together that this was something that was happening basically everywhere and to everyone which maybe like lifts it to a point where you can't just blame yourself anymore yeah Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Well, and that connects back to what I mentioned earlier in the last session about Sinead O'Connor, because that, you know, she she tears up the picture of the Pope in 92 on Saturday Night Live. And many of us, you know, didn't know why, you know, didn't know uh, about that yet. Hadn't really made um, the national news in America, at least in, in a really yeah. um visible way uh yet um uh though you know there were plenty of other reasons to historically be upset with the catholic church you know for for past 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 abuses but um yeah just i wonder if um there's still a trend to sort of normalize um this kind of crappy behavior uh like i was just listening to your episode with tuck woodstock on on the new york times and I've always liked the New York Times kind of champion it as, you know, this is the arguably best, you know, news outlet in the world, right? Um, and and reasonably objective. And I have friends that work there and 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 yet they are doing a horrible job at covering queer and trans uh topics. Um, do you see that? So you, you know, speak to that if you'd like or or other things that relate to that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I love, I know it's the episode description, but I love Tuck's quote in that, which is, if you were writing an article about someone named Janet and your newspaper asked you to find a source who wanted to kill Janet, like, why is that unbiased reporting? Um, and that's, you know, I don't know. I think that there is some kind of basic human inclination that people feel, especially if they are 
not in a marginalized community, but in sort of, you know, the community that things, the the culture we have is is designed to to validate the existence of that like what we have, surely what we have must work. It must work kind of, right? And that it's disturbing to realize that like on a larger social scale, like your parents were never really adults. Um, Cause we want that. Like, I want that. I want there to be someone in charge of something. Like even as not a religious person, I feel like I went through something like um, a, a loss of faith when I realized how bad our legal system was, which I think is you know, a lot people are learning much younger than I did, especially lately, but that I took until my late twenties to figure out and found to be a very radicalizing experience. Cause I think it's also like kind of <laughs> cobbling together a life as imperfectly as we all do. And like screwing things up on very large and very small scales. It just feels good to imagine that there are people out there who are in charge of the infrastructures that dictate our lives and who are like better and smarter than us intrinsically, like somehow more something. And um, I think different people have different capacities and we all know different things and we all need each other to, to keep building a world that, that works at <laughs> to some extent, but um, there is like something scary and also very liberating to realize that like the entire world as we know it is being, run by people who are really surprised when you make a reddit post about how there's a little arrow pointing to the side of your car that the gas is on like some people all that always know that and a lot of people just live their whole lives and they don't know there's a little arrow and we'd like to believe that like you know that we're smarter than that as humans and i you know but it's just that's what we are we have this amazing combination of strength and weakness and if we accept that people even at the very top of every hierarchy we come up with are capable of, um, you know, as much uh, human frailty as anybody else, then I think that means that we can offer more care to each other because we won't feel quite as certain that the the judgment passed on them has been correct. Well, oh, no. Well, I, I was agreeing. I mean, you look at, uh, I'm, big history nerd and you look back even England and the the whole government was to keep everybody below them to they used certain tools to make sure that people stayed in line and didn't rise above that because then there'd be a revolution and um I still see the similarities between today's government and the government we supposedly came over here to escape, you know. And I, I don't know if that comes with power, makes people drunk and do stupid things, or, you know, I don't know why we haven't learned that lesson. You know, and that's kind of one of the the things I think about a lot is that it's it it at least comes very naturally to me to be like, well hopefully we're we're all getting better and we're learning and next year we're going to be you know less horrible to each other and really it's like you know you got like individual people learn and grow we can like create you know circumstances and and resources that let people kind of do the most with what they have but also that it's like kind of people with the same characteristics kind of keep being born and keep having new ideas and and falling for the same things and I don't know it feels good to in some ways to accept that because then we don't have to be so disappointed which makes me think of you know just getting all these classroom evaluations as a as an ADHD riddled child that were like Sarah is not fulfilling her potential and it's like no bitch I am this is my potential yeah I got that too I was just telling my students that uh, the C plus 79% was, was the grade that I most often received because it was the grade that said that Chris would be an all A student if he would just buckle down and, and do his homework and not, you know, DJ all night at the college radio station or put on multimedia avant-garde theater per performances or whatever. Right. So, um, <clears throat> you know, um, so do you think, do you think that there's, so a lot of what you're saying, and and I noticed this in my listening experience to your, to your podcasts, 
that for instance <clears throat> i had already conquered my hatred of disco from from when it came out um but then when i listened to the podcast i i opened up even more um in in kind of forgiving um uh that that's that that moment in history and also realizing that i i actually love i will survive and donna summer and mm -hmm. and um you know as you so, should right right and you know so it got all mixed up in other things but do you think there's a, a vulnerability <laughs> to having that empathy and to opening up and letting go of that judgment that judgment is easier for for people uh, because it's easier to dismiss the thing than to grapple with the truth of it. Um, mm -hmm. So do you think that this transformation thing is really scary for a lot of people because it makes them vulnerable if they if they open up and have that empathy and compassion? Yeah, totally. And I think that it's, you know, I see that just in the microcosm in my own life and been kind of having end of year thoughts the last couple of days and noticing how, um, how much easier it feels to kind of look back at things that I regret and be like, well, I really did the wrong thing there. That was a bad choice of mine. Shouldn't have done that. Um, and that there's a kind of acceptance and forgiveness that just feels like muscles relaxing when you compare it to the sort of needing to stay in the defensive posture and needing to say like, well, it was right of me to do that. It was, I don't see how it could have affected people negatively. Like, I really think that it's eventually people will see that I was right. And that kind of protecting your belief in the basic rightness of the way you're living your life can kind of, you know, can, can be very destructive to you and can, uh, can keep you from enjoying so much that you possibly could. Um, and I, I don't know, the kind of theme of the show is, you know, looking at people and saying, like, I don't think that they made good choices, but that's not we're evaluating them. That's not what we're evaluating. We're evaluating kind of what our treatment of them looked like and whether it was warranted and what it was serving. Um, and the fact of the matter is that most of us spend most of the time making bad choices and we still just have to find some kind of empathy um, for each other and mercy for ourselves. And that I, yeah, I think that entered, I think that it's scary to attempt to approach other people's stories empathetically, because that means that we're going to start doing with our, that with ourselves. And that really freaks us out. Or our family members, you know, uh, yeah. cause that's, <laughs> that's the, the private, um, area of, of extreme judgment quite often. So, um, does anybody else have any other, uh, questions? Cause I'm, I'm just monopolizing. I hate it. Okay. Well, I think we've run the course. We can quit a little early uh, from what we thought, uh, which is totally fine. And um, everyone, thank you for Sarah Marshall. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you for coming. All right.